Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 110. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey everyone, welcome back. Another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. And Jonathan, back in Canada, was off at the Veterinary Innovation Summit down in Portland. So we're going to be diving into, Jonathan has the crystal ball now. And he is going to tell us, where is veterinary medicine headed? So you're putting that on me right in the first 30 seconds. Yes. I like it. With 100% accuracy. No, no. Crystal ball is 50-50, buddy. Okay. He's going to take a guess. He's going to flip a coin and tell us where veterinary medicine is headed. That is correct. So this last week, I was down in uh, Portland for the Veterinary Innovation Summit. This had been a summit that one of our previous guests, Dr. Craig Mosley, had attended had recommended if I had ever had a chance to go, which I hadn't, and then COVID happened. And we had gone back and forth in terms of timing. There's always other things that could be done. Said, enough's enough. Booked the tickets last week and went down. Uh, I was probably one of four or five Canadians down there. There was not many of us. And this was a really great summit in that I did not know next to anybody. The flip side of that was we had five of our previous veterinary project podcast guests there and that was so cool Mike we didn't even talk about this in the pre-recording Gary Marshall had a setup for dinner even before I had arrived that was cool like just for a small group of you a small group so and then Megan Sprinkle who we're going to speak to and speak with who's a veterinary nutritionist there is a number of individuals there and and all different um, um, places in their career so again super informal first dinner really nice got together with everybody who hadn't also met in person before for a nice picture which we posted on the on the um, Facebook page LinkedIn etc that was great but that's not what we're here to talk about it was fun we really enjoyed seeing everybody hope to be able to do that again in future whether it's VMX Vegas etc okay one sec I know we're not here to talk about it but we we have a very loose script for this episode so I'm going to throw curveballs at you (laughs) Of the people you met, the, the previous guests from the podcast, was everyone kind of as you expected? Because we know them from online and we've chatted with them via Zoom, right? It was everyone kind of as you expected? Or was there any any interesting surprises? You know, sometimes you meet someone. I always compare this to like you hear someone on the radio, you hear their voice, you've pictured what they look like, and then you meet them and you're like, wow, you are nothing like what I like created in my head. So the majority, yes. And here's where we're going on the spot. They're going to hear this. They're going to be like, what are you talking yeah. about? So Brent Mayhab, who's chief medical officer with Royal Canin, was a connector. He was always speaking with different people in the room at different times. So kind, so considerate. He did a, a talk as well, too, um, which was great. Exactly what I expected and fantastic. Gary, as he had mentioned on one of our recent extrovert extraordinaire same thing connector great to sit with them learn who's the who who again as the canadian in the room i didn't know who was what which was nice melanie we didn't get to spend a lot of time together because she was again just coming back from a stint of locoming in new york had to go back again right away great smubbly bubbly etc uh the last night which was which was really nice is there was a group of about eight eight of us went to the side we're sitting at a table drinking some bourbon talking that those intimate connections and, and debating and back and forth. That was really enjoyable. Elliot was part of that. So a recent um, guest in July, getting to know Elliot more. And I believe the title of his podcast was A Man for All Seasons, which he didn't really enjoy. I'm putting him on the spot, but I don't think he would like that title. <laughs> it's what I read out of it. But it was great to get to know him. He's with Instinct. And um, the conversation went in different directions than what I thought they would. So he would be the one 
where I went, wait a second, we're going to, we're going to continue this conversation. Cause I don't think you were fully open on our, on our podcast. So, Maybe he needs bourbon before recording. I am putting them on the spot on this podcast <laughs> and we can do that. Uh, Kate was amazing. Kate Breezebaugh, she actually was one of the presenters for uh, the pocket, uh, pocket pathologist as a presenter in terms of entrepreneurs um, having the chance to get some funding through Purina, uh, Purina Institute, I believe. She did an amazing job. She is everything that we thought and very extroverted in terms of her ability to speak and share uh, value from a pathologist standpoint. It was great. I downloaded the app right after it. Uh, we are going to be using that in practice without a doubt. Nice. Okay, well, let's uh, I guess dive in. Tell me, tell me where the future of veterinary medicine is headed. I'm tasked with keeping you on track because I, I know like you love this stuff, which is excellent. I'm very interested as well. Um, but we're going to try and you know channel this into usable bites for the listener. I like it. You need to keep me on track. If we look at the website for BIS, so BIS stands for Veterinary Innovation Summit. It offers a comprehensive look at the future of the veterinary world. While providing an open forum for collaboration, the Veterinary Innovation Summit creates a space where some of the most progressive thinkers gather, network, and strategize ways to prepare for the future. I believe that they were successful in really doing the second part, which was creating a space for progressive thinkers to gather, network, and strategize. Some of the pieces related to innovation, I didn't find were there in the way that I thought maybe they were going to be. I was hoping for some really out-of-the-box ideas or things that... I have not heard on VIN or any of the, the business magazines I read or anywhere else in our forums. I didn't really get that. There's a couple of businesses I'm going to be following up on for sure that were within the vendors, but nothing extraordinary that way. I think the bringing together and strategizing, commenting, and in some cases, even debating, not enough, but some, that to me was the allure. And one of the things, and I'll jump right into it, and this was provided for by Justin McClash. He's an area medical director with BCA Canada in British Columbia. He posted this on LinkedIn while I think just shortly after the session was going, and it was discussing um, spectrum of care. And we coming out of school, academia, uh, if you're at a teaching hospital, always discussing gold standard care. And this is a quote from him. Uh, As professionals, we learn to offer the gold standard of care but we quickly discover it often clashes with client expectations. What if we changed the channel and considered a spectrum of care approach, a continuum of acceptable care that allowed us to remain responsive to client expectations, priorities, and financial limitations? What if we taught students non-judgmental communication skills and pet family-centered communication? We would reduce professional stressors, improve client compliance, and have better patient outcomes. Maybe it's time to reimagine the simple art of communication. There's a lot to unpackage in that comment, in that conversation. And that was what a lot of the first part of the summit was about. Looking at the current state of veterinary medicine, our desire to provide gold standard medicine, when we actually even ourselves don't know what that means. We reviewed research that had been done that looks at what clients want and the number thing they don't want is the most expensive option uh, provided as first option, acknowledging that there's guilt in there, acknowledging that there's maybe an inability to say no or not understanding the rest of the option. So therefore they just jump to that and then later regret it. And when we're looking at continuum of acceptable care, that that's on us as veterinary professionals to understand and communicate as opposed to regulators holding us back from being able to do that if we're talking telehealth, telemedicine, or the limitations of a liability standpoint, us getting into legal issue because we haven't just gone with what's the most expensive way to go when we're talking CTs, MRIs, referrals, et cetera. Right now in the US, they are estimating that by 2030, there will be 75 million animals that will not have access to veterinary care. The vet-centric model, which I've spoken about on this podcast before, is no longer possible, both because of the shortage of veterinary professionals, which when there was the CMO, CEO panel, everybody raised their hands. There is a true professional shortage now. It's showing up in research over and over. But also the ability for clients to reach out and get care in different places than veterinary medicine 
And therefore we actually may be even excluded from the conversation if we don't figure out the spectrum of care availability and being able to get in different areas. That was a great discussion. That was also a turning point for saying, hmm, what are we doing from a technology basis wise as regulators to limit the actual availability of animal care and therefore also not protecting the public, but causing harm. That was an interesting take. Yes. Okay. I was doing a quick Google trying to, to give credit here for what I'm about to say, but I never found it. So this is someone out there gets credit for this saying, but what it made me think of is you always hear the golden rule as it, as it pertains to treating others, right? Like do unto others as you would want done unto you or something like that. And then someone out there came up with like, well, no, 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 we should be focusing on the platinum rule, which is do unto others as they want to be like treated, right? Yes. And I think about that with, with the spectrum of care that you're talking about in veterinary medicine. Um, I've always kind of had an issue, you know, with sort of the gold standard. And I've practiced in areas where, you know, financially speaking, the gold standard is just simply not possible, um, right. you know? And so I learned very early in my career you know, the, my definition of the gold standard was always like, what does the client, you know, want, what are they looking yeah. to achieve? Yeah. So I was kind of lucky. You I had were probably really very profet You were probably very successful as a result of that. Yes. And I mean, w whether, whether this is a little bit of luck of where I landed, but I mean, I am fortunate. I had just tremendous mentorship in my first roles in veterinary medicine. So, I mean, that's really where I, what I would attribute it to, but that's kind of, I think of that, the gold standard versus the platinum standard. Agreed. Love it. And I think that's a conversation that is now happening. Uh, and when it's happening at this level, meaning the, the influencers, this, the, those that have to create strategies within their larger companies, et cetera, I'm excited because the trickle down effect hopefully will happen. I'll also put this plug in, um, acknowledging that I didn't see enough academics there or maybe wasn't present to know that the academics were present because there's a lot of this conversation that need needs to include the universities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was a little bit disappointing. And again, maybe I wasn't there. Um, I'll change scope a little bit because we've got a short time here. Really interesting facts for us that came out from it. Quarterly expenditures per household, a 40 year trend growing from an average of $100 in 1980 for veterinary spend to over $300 in 200, 2018. We've heard about veterinary medicine and, and the delivery of care being recession proof. That continues to prove true, even flattening at times where you have recessions and showing those graphs, but not decreasing outside of a little bit in the 2020 uh, COVID and the initial portions. Compounded growth percent over year is 2.9% in real growth terms. And then if we look at overall growth per year, the number of vets since 2010 in the U.S. has been growing at only 2,000 or 2.7%. And if we look at the contribution of the majority of grads coming out of school, especially in my world, when it looks at mixed animal, it's not looking good right now. The percentage of 30-year-old 30 year out veterinarians is at 34% right now. If we're talking beef cattle veterinarians, and that number is 39% for equine veterinarians. And sorry, just to clarify, are you saying once they've been out 30 years, only 34% of them remain? Love that you asking that. Of the total percentage of veterinarians that are out there right now as beef cattle veterinarians, 34% of them have been out 30 years or more. Okay. Which means we are not getting the rebuild in our new grads or five to 10 year grads because they are leaving that portion of the profession, which is and, leading to an exacerbation of our yeah. shortages. And that 34% presumably will be lost like just to attrition retirement in That's the near-ish exactly. future. That's right. Yep. Uh, surprising for me, demand is rising in, in specialist needs higher than GP. So I didn't know that, but that's what's happening. And therefore, you also have a generalist shortage leading to extended wait time, stretch capacity to accept workup cases, et cetera. 
20 to 30 percent of vets right now want to work less than they did in 2016, even if it is for less pay. So the summary of this talk was that our professional shortage and our crisis is rooted in positive long-term trends in terms of expenditures and our market breadth in terms of health across the industry. But the workforce shortage is broad-based, not specific to one area with no signs of letting up anytime soon. Okay. It was nice to have some numbers and, you know, like official numbers put on that. I feel like broad stroke here, everything you just said didn't shock me, right? Not like I feel like we knew that. Was there discussion either in this talk or once the bourbon started getting poured about what does the other side of that look like? Like it, how do we start reversing that and, and, you know, heading in a positive direction? Sure does. Let's talk about that. Those numbers were provided by a uh, reference, sorry, by Dr. James Lloyd. So just to make sure that we've got reference to that for anybody who wants to look those numbers up. Um, yes. So look at you fed right into it. Potential options. We heard about this at the CVMA. So the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association National Conference uh, in the summer, uh, speaking about veterinary professional associates, VPAs. This was the first time I had heard of it. And on the human uh, end, they already exist. We had a PA, and that's what it is, a PA speak at the CVMA conference and part of a panel. It was great. Uh, this was, again, presented by uh, April Steele, who's a DVM uh, working on Colorado, and Jim Lloyd again. Currently, this is already in the works uh, at Lincoln Memorial, and then there's other multiple other programs that are being looked at. This is a master's program for individuals in veterinary clinical care. So it's professional degree credentialing. They don't need to have a bachelor going into it. Similar to us, we don't need to have a master's before we go towards our doctor of veterinary medicine. This VPA would be under the direct supervision of a DVM and that would be accessible to diverse candidates, those that potentially didn't get into vet school, those want to take their tech degree to the next level, VTSs, et cetera. This is imagining the role of practice Examples of where this role could fit in within the context of a normal practice, medical team leadership, being able to examine, diagnose, ooh, that word diagnosis, and treat uncomplicated cases, perform dentistry and minor surgery, and there would be levels of dedication or delegation depending on the level of competency, and provide for advanced coordination of care in clinics. So the automatic concerns with this. And this was presented at the CVMA. There's a number of them. The first is liability. How do you do this in the context of Veterinary Profession Act that doesn't allow for diagnosed prescribing and or doing surgery? How do you do that? You need to go to the legislation in order to be able to amend. Number two, surgical skills. April uh, in this, this um, presentation had a really great point in terms of veterinary students only getting 10 hours of actual surgical skill time within their four years of the program. That would be equivalent of what this VPA role would get. Also, additional questions related up to pathophysiology and the unknowns that come into any surgical uh, procedure, which is never normal, and how would they handle that? Her answer was to the direct delegation, again, under the supervision of a veterinarian. On top of that, the skill level that these individuals would come into. On top of that, to the mentorship that they would receive in the practice. I thought it was a really nice answer to something that we automatically just poo-poo because it is... Mm -hmm not allowed within our current confines. Well, that's a possible solution. Yeah. And sorry, jumping back on the, the master's program. So start to finish, like how long would, is this, is this a two or a four year or what is this training? Uh, I can't quote, sorry, I can't quote on that. I think it was a two year program. It could be four. I'm not too sure. And okay. I, I want to look into this further. Again, this is the second time I've heard in three months. So. Okay. So Just basically a way to bring sort of more help into the, into a veterinary clinic you know, kind of in between, say, a tech role and a DVM role with a That's more correct. of a scope of work than a tech, but not the same as a DVM. That's so, correct. And I, I, I mean, I'm, this is already happening on the human side, is it not? Correct. It, yes, it is. Yeah, they were talking about that in terms of how long it took. So uh, they use this example, uh, start working with accreditation process, etc. It was 24 years between the first tech school coming in and actual accreditation. How long is it going to take us for a VPA to come into being? 
to when our uh, regulators, et cetera, are able to work on accreditation. 24 it years? It was a good zinger. That is comical. It was, yes. Because okay, that everyone was one just of the hang, that... hang tough, hang in there for 24 more years, then we got you. Then we got a solution coming. Agreed. Uh, they talked about impact on the business, fear that this would actually decrease profit in human medicine. It's not shown this. It's actually shown an average of 20% increase to net profits for those that are using PAs in human medicine. So some really nice facts to back up what the research showed. So as an overall great discussion, that's one of the ways of meeting the shortages. Number two, which I've been down on this bandwagon before, um, this was provided by Whisker Docs, compelling evidence for broadening our definition of veterinary care related to telehealth, telemedicine. Hmm. A discussion that's been happening for the last five years. Where are we on it? What does that look like? This one really, for me, um, was a great presentation in trying to uncomplicate what we complicate as a veterinary profession. Pet parents want their needs met with a seamless experience, whether that's pre-appointment, through the appointment and afterwards. We've been doing telehealth, meaning phone calls, faxes, emails since the start of time being the 1980s. There wasn't an issue with that until we started bringing the virtual care uh, and responsibilities related to the DCPR into context. Uh, that was a great discussion. Nobody that wants to go against the regulators, but do definitely want to broaden the terms. And in many cases, there was some really emotional conversation around what does it mean to have a virtual VCPR to the end needs of the veterinarian as well as the patient, as opposed to just holding a lane that we say can only be such because that's what's been the case for as long as we've known it. And so there was a great discussion about really, are we defining the lanes to protect ourselves as the veterinary industry, or are we actually trying to meet the needs of our pets right now? And I've said this before, um, there's a lot of it's an easy observation to see we are a protectionist. And I think yeah. that is going to get uh, pushed forward one way or another, whether we like it or somebody else outside of industry. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, telehealth already being used. It's been used or it's being used a lot more than what I thought it was being used in the U S again, a little bit more. I'll say this They're They're forward thinking, progressive and aggressive compared to us in Canada. We have a couple of great companies in Canada that have already met the needs within Ontario based on their uh, updated telemedicine policies. Uh, I think that um, this will only continue to be the case as these companies look at out of the box ways of, of working in and unfortunately sometimes out of the confines of regulation, which I, I don't agree with, but it takes time. Nice. Yep. And this is interesting. Uh, this is sort of tangent my my opinion my thoughts here so far hearing your your big takeaways these are all i don't hr is probably a poor word for it but it's all like you know in that umbrella of thinking when i in my own head thought of vet innovation summit i'm thinking you're going to go there and there's going to be products that are like space age like cutting edge you know like i think of uh like the tono pen replacing that Oh, horrific thing where you set it on the pet's eyeball like that's what i think of when i in yeah. terms of innovation right but it's like a lot of these are actually just conversations on you know sort of the state of and how we can do veterinary medicine differently and this was part of our our discussion at the end and connecting with different individuals that are are, are working with companies or leading companies is really was this innovative was the council innovative and um, again, a kudos to uh, the group that put this on. So this is put on by the NABC is uh, inadvertently I met with two council members, which I didn't even know they were council members at the time that I was providing my opinions. <laughs> and they were fully open to it. And once they actually recognized, like they then told me that they were council or, pre or previous council members, um, we had a great discussion and they were there. They want the feedback. <laughs> Yeah, and they were open to that feedback, and and this is pre drinks or anything like that, so it was not drink induced to any degree or anything like that. I was just impressed with their um, their availability to take opinion well, and it is that. Nice. Okay. Yep. So I, I thought that was really good. Nice. Um, day two. This was another interesting, really interesting keynote to start the day. Uh, Mike, if you were to take the 
general public, including veterinarians, and as a percentage, what would you say would be the percentage of humans that feel that they are self-aware? Oh, shit. I feel like you, you got to give me multiple choice and I'm choosing C. And self-aware <laughs> means seeing clearly and acting smartly no matter what the future holds, empowering your team to do the right thing. And self-awareness helps you as a senior leader balance the, the matrices of every day and future versus daily. Okay. Sorry, and to clarify the question, are you saying they've been ran through a series of tests and this has determined their level of self-awareness or they're self-identifying as self-aware? They are self-identifying as self-aware. And I'm going to give you even a better definition just so that you know. Understanding who we are and how we're seen. Oh my. Okay. I, I honestly have no idea. I feel people are going to self-identify at a higher percent than is actually true. Well, you're off to a good start. So um, I don't know, 24% just to, add, to throw a number against the wall. Look at you go. So that's wrong, but well, it's a lot better than the guesses that were out there. So 95% of individuals think of themselves as self-aware via research when actually 10 to 15% of people fit the criteria of being self-aware. This was provided by uh, a lady named Tasha Urich. Urich last name being E-U-R-I-C-H. She has a book, How Self-Awareness Helps Us Succeed. And there was some tangible tools provided for in this talk. And I would recommend, and as I'm going to do, those to go to her website. There's some really nice tools, so useful to how to bring self-awareness and not only understanding who we are, but how we are seen by individuals around us. Wow. This was all second day was three behaviors of preparing future ready leaders. And the future ready leaders definitely, in my view, was an innovative uh, approach for the council to take for this, this um, VIS because the last talk, which was provided for by the chair is adapt or die. And I think we're in that place right now in veterinary medicine. If you're not self-aware and you're not adapting, you're going to die in veterinary medicine. There's too many new options available for pet parents. There is too many markets available that actually brought right outside of what veterinary medicine provides for. It was amazing. Brent provided a talk on in China as to the number that are moving into middle class, wanting to have animals or already do and the low teens in terms of percentage of those that ever access veterinary care. We don't want that to happen in North America, Europe, and beyond. We need to adapt now or die, without a doubt. Man, I'm still hung up on that gap, like 95% versus 10 to 15%. Like there is a large gap in between those two. Yep, very much. A couple of the bold or the, the bold notes that I have in here, which was, uh, I've got to think more on this. I'm a why person. I like to understand why I like the data. I like the facts, et cetera. Tasha basically said, Jonathan, you need to stop doing that as a leader. Don't ask questions such as why am I so hard driving during change versus what are my patterns and what can I do differently? A what question versus a why question. Interesting. Will both open you up to self-awareness and the pros and cons, but also change the dynamic in terms of the conversation with that other person. Man. Okay. I need more info on this from you. Example um, number two, I'll give this one. Why are we like oil and water together versus what can I do to show this person that I'm the best person? I'm the best person for that job. So instead of just complaining victimhood or using the why excuse, it's what do I need to do? What do I need to be aware of? And how can I come across differently to that individual? A lot of accountability in that. That is fascinating to me. I'm going to get this info from you and dive in. Like, I just love this stuff. And I'm sitting here picturing, imagine, imagine two people that, that are self-decidedly 95% aware, but really aren't as per like the numbers you provided. And you can imagine the miscommunication that can happen, you know, with 
as you're talking about these why statements firing back and forth, both of them thinking like, I'm so self-aware. How come they can't see this? Without a doubt. Yeah, that's funny. And again, we go back to, you know, the popularity of our podcast being the highest around communication. This, all of these pieces, again, is this innovative? Maybe not, but it could it make a difference to your business, your life and your career without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, innovation is excellent. I enjoy innovation, but you can make a lot of ground just doing, you know, the, the basic things or the common things very well. Yeah, agreed. The innovation things I think are going to come from the side conversations that happened, the individual met connections. We've got a few more podcast guests now to reach uh, and bring into our group here that I think will help the community a lot. So I've already had a couple of reach outs since uh, coming back yesterday. Which I'm nice. About. Yeah, I knew I knew we'd have a podcast fodder, a list of guests lined up for everyone following I this. Sure hope so. And there's also some really nice comments back from listeners that, again, I always am amazed and shocked that people listen and a different take on veterinary medicine from our perspective as, you know, Canadians in, in our land. And uh, it's nice to hear, you know, positive comments coming back. And there were some that uh, came through. So kudos to you and me. Nice. Yep. Awesome. Well, anything That's else? It. I mean, we're getting tight on time here. We better wrap this and let everyone get on their way. Just in that, uh, I think it was well worth a couple of days. There are some points here I'm going to take back to my team. Um, without a doubt, I think there are opportunities to always look at broadening your own views for the benefit of others, whether that's talking about pet care or the teams you're leading. And this Veterinary Innovation Summit just brought that home for me even more. Nice. I like your comment on, you know, bringing it back to your team. I always view conferences kind of like reading a book. It's really nice to read a book and learn some new things. But if you don't take that and action it, you know, there's, there's really no difference than whether if you hadn't read the book. So it's nice to hear, you know, go to the conference, learn the new things, but then bring a few things back and put them into action, you know, and actually make the difference. And what a better time to do it. We have the last three months of the year here. Let's knock it down. There is some great opportunity available um, both personal and professional life let's take advantage of it thank you for listening to the veterinary project podcast as a recap on behalf of our hosts the veterinary project podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly so be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived if you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know please like love and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing as we're available on all the usual suspects if you know of others that may benefit from these conversations we'd love it if you please share the show with them as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye.